We're getting down there. There's this week and next week on the fruit of the Spirit, and then we're going to be changing our services towards our worship uh, study towards uh, God's road to success. Anybody here like to have success in their life? You just raise your hand. Oh, yeah, quite a few hands going up. And uh, we're going to study the book of Joshua. It's a book of victory. It's success, and it's just a really amazing book. And uh, we want you to come along. We won't go verse by verse. We'll be taking chunks and uh, out of it because uh, it's a pretty lengthy and big book. But, uh, and that'll be exciting. But we have two weeks to wrap up the fruit of the Spirit. Today it's on gentleness. And uh, there's a little confusion over what uh, gentleness is. So the question is, uh, what, what is it? What is this thing called gentleness? And the answer is, in the Greek, it's proutes. Well, that doesn't help you much, but it's been translated mostly down through the previous translations in time as the word meekness. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of meekness. I mean, I, what is that? What, what is meekness? All right. Well, most of the time, people think of meekness as being a sissy, a wimp, uh, someone who doesn't stand up or defend themselves. They just take it on the chin. Now, you've noticed this picture of me in my younger days? A little bit on the skinny side, all right? You notice there's no weights on that, that barbell? I mean, that's not meekness. You know, that, that, that's being a weakling. That's not meekness. Moses was meek. Jesus was meek. Uh, Paul was meek. And none of these guys are sissies. In fact, that word proutes means that you're somewhere in the balance between being angry. You're, you know, you're the volcanic eruption that just blows up. It's somewhere between that and not being angry. And I got the pressure cooker there where you just stuff it all inside. I mean, it's, it's all there. You got, anybody here never been angry? No, no, okay. But we handle it in two ways. We either blow up on people when something doesn't go our way, or we clam up and we're like a pressure cooker. You've seen this in the news a lot. When the pressure cooker finally blows the lid, some guy with an AK-47 goes somewhere and he rattles it off and a lot of bodies are left, right? Because he just... It's a meekness is the mean in between those two extremes. That's what Plato said. And he's defining the terms he's using in the Greek language, okay? That it, it's in between there. Um, I like to liken it to a, a watchdog. Now, the watchdog is friendly to the good, usually the owner, right? But he's pretty hostile to the bad guy that's trying to break in, right? And that's the whole idea of the watchdog. That's kind of way meekness is. Meekness is very positive to righteousness, holiness, goodness, truth. But it's very hostile to unrighteousness, unholiness, sin. It's very hostile towards evil, and especially evil practices of people. All right? And so it's, it's a controlled anger. It's a controlled anger. I know every now and then a person will say to me, well, I just can't control my anger. And I, I probably told you this before. Oh, yes, you can. And you do it all the time. My kids were misbehaving, and I'm yelling and screaming at them, and I'm angry because they've done something really wrong. The phone rings, I pick it up, and I say, hello. <laughs> Why? Because I'm, I'm in control. I'm in control of my anger. I don't value their opinion of me enough to control it, so I unload on my kids. But I don't know who's on the other end of the line. I value the unknown more than I do the known, and I pull all my emotion into control, and I say, hello. You see, we're always in control. It's not misplaced on the wrong party. You see, when you blow up, and I got the volcano there, man, when that thing blows up, you are venting all your anger on someone else. You're taking it out on them, and you're screaming, you're yelling, and you're pouring it out on them. You know, my kids knew, man, when, my, when Dad got angry, you better dive under the coffee table because there was some incoming coming. 
Yeah. You guys, I did. The other side of this, it's misplaced. I, I'm taking all my anger out on somebody else. The other side of this is, I'm taking all my anger out on me. I, I stuff it, I put it inside, and I'm angry, but I'm not releasing it, and it, it's all stuck inside. It's misplaced anger. It's, it's on the wrong party, either others or myself. It's never for the wrong reason either. Some people get angry about everything. And so what happens? People around them just exclude them out of their life. They shut down. They don't tell them anything because no matter what you say, they're going to get angry about it. And so they try to keep their distance. Uh, it's for the, they don't pick and choose their battles. It's always for the right reason. It's always for the right reason. There are reasons to get angry. If someone were to do something intentionally hostile towards my grandchildren, I think I would get angry and it would be right for me to do so. It would be right. You would meet the old dentist before I got saved. <laughs> yep, that's just the way it is. And it would be right because I should be angry when injustice is served. When someone is wrongly injured, I should be angry over those things. You know God is. Do you know God is angry over sin? Oh, hello. God gets angry. Do you know the Bible says God gets angry? Have you noticed that? You ever heard of the wrath of God Almighty? Where does that expression come from? It comes from the Bible. So anger, it, 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 meekness is about a controlled anger, never focused on the wrong person and never for the wrong reason, Always focused in the right way and for the right reason. It's a controlled anger. Ah, this is what William Barclay says. All right. He says, uh, meekness is God's gentleman. It's the person who knows how to control their anger. They know when it's right to be angry and when it's not appropriate to be angry. They know when the time is right and when it is wrong. We're going to find that what do you do when you get angry? Well, when you get angry, it's a God-given emotion. And that's why you all get it, because God give it, given it to you, all of you. <laughs> I have it, you have it, we all have anger. It's a God-given emotion. When something happens, I get a surge of an adrenaline rush that gives me a surge of extra energy. It's amazing what you can do when you get a surge of adrenaline. When I was a teenage guy, that weakling guy there I showed you, that's really not my picture, but that's what I looked like. That's what I looked like. I was a skinny little runt. I had this 32 willies. I've shown you that before. And I was jacking it up. It slipped off the jack and came down on my foot. So my foot, there's still a tire on it, but the, the whole car is on it. I, and I got that adrenaline rush, and I lifted it right off my foot and pulled it out. How do you do that? How do you do that? That adrenaline rush is a God-given surge of energy to do something about whatever it is that's making you angry. Do you get that? See, what happens is I focus it on somebody else, or I focus it on me, and God says, no, 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 no. Focus that energy on the problem. Focus that energy on the problem. Not on people, and you're one of them, not on yourself, not on others yourself. Take all that energy God's given you in that anger, channel it and focus it to solve the problem. And we're going to see in a few moments that's exactly what Jesus did. Because Jesus got angry. But he was the perfect gentleman. He knew when to be angry and when not to be angry. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. When you and I Start to live like Jesus. I don't care what, who it is in your life that comes in. It could be a spouse. It could be an in-law. It could be your kids. It could be a boss. But you know it. They do something that pushes your button, you're angry, you're upset. Rather than blow up on that person, rather than internalize it and later blow up yourself, 
focus, that energy to solve the problem. Solve the problem. That's what the Bible says. Probably not aware of this verse. Maybe you are. Be angry. Do you notice something? That's an imperative. God is commanding you to be angry. But it's followed up by a little expression. And do not sin. Problem is, most of us are angry, and that's the problem. We do sin. <laughs> Why? Because we blow up on other people, we internalize it, and we blow up on ourselves, but we don't focus all that energy on the problem. Now watch what he says next. He says, Be angry, it's a command, do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Whatever is angering you today, focus all your energy to solve it today why God gave it to you. You know what we do? We put it inside, the pressure fills, and we let the day go by, the sun goes by. The sun goes down on my wrath. The sun comes up, the day goes by, the sun goes down on my wrath. The day goes by. I got this inside. I'm holding a grudge against somebody. I'm bitter against a relative. I'm bitter against an old friend. I'm bitter. I, you know, and I'm holding this stuff inside. I'm letting many, many, God says, no, that's wrong. I gave you that energy to do something about the problem. Do something. Now, you go a few verses later, four verses later, and God says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all, here, watch, bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Those are all different manifestations of anger. He says, listen, be angry, and then he says, get rid of it. People say, well, it sounds to me like the Bible's contradicting itself. No, what he's saying is you deal with your anger when it arises. You deal with it in a constructive way so you can get rid of it. Don't hang on to it. There should be no bitter Christians. We, we should be people that are the least bitter because why? When there's something bothering us, we confront it, we resolve it, we solve it. We don't hang on to it forever and ever. Jesus said this, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. The word gentle in the King James Version is meek and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your soul. You got to yoke up with Jesus. You got to hook up with him. You got to be like the guy that's walking with Jesus. You know, you got the, the yoke on and you're plowing together. You're solving problems together. And that's what he's talking about. He was meek. Listen, he was meek when he cleansed the temple. Do you remember that? John chapter 2, later in Matthew chapter 21, he does it again. There are two times in the Bible where Jesus actually goes into the temple. And what he found there was that they had taken a place of worship and they made it into a, a place of business. They were selling merchandise and they're selling sacrifices at an exorbitant rate. And, and they were saying people's offerings that were brought, oh, you can't bring that in because it's not basically kosher, uh, but you got to buy our own. And it became a business to make money. And Jesus, when he went into the temple, and the temple court, he found men selling, he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple. Hey, I'll tell you what, Jesus was angry. Jesus was angry. But Jesus is sinless. When he saw what was happening, he got angry. He solved the problem, making a whip, and he drove out all the animals. He got everything out. He, he solved the problem. You get rid of the animals. You can't sell them. People can bring their own animals. He solves the problem. He focuses all of his attention on the problem. He said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a marketplace? His disciples later remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house will consume me. As the King James put it, the zeal of the Lord has eaten me up. Jesus was angry, but he focused not on people. He didn't internalize it. He solved the problem. Get these animals out of here. Get these out. That was solved the whole problem. Solved the whole problem. Jesus was gentle and meek also when he blasted the Pharisees. All right? The Pharisees were so self-righteous, and they were putting standards on people which they themselves could not meet, and they weren't meeting them, and he says it in Matthew. He says, Woe to you teachers in law uh, of the law. He's talking about the Old Testament. And, and the Pharisees, he calls them, you hypocrites. 
Well, that's not a very nice thing to say, a meek, humble person. Would they say that? Yes, they would. It's doing the right thing at the right time, displaying your anger in the right way at the right time. That's what Jesus is doing. He calls them hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is? It's somebody that wears a mask. On Halloween, we're going to have a lot of hypocrites come into the door because they're going to be pretending to be something that they are not. And they wear the mask. A hypocrite is somebody, these self-righteous people who are trying to impose on other people righteous standards, which they themselves were not keeping. He says, you hypocrites, woe to you blind guides. He says, you're trying to guide other people, but you're blind. You're just going to lead them right into the ditch. He's blasting him. He says, you fools, you blind fools, you blind men, you hypocrites, you blind guides. Somebody said it's wrong to name call. I don't know about that. Jesus calling them hypocrites, blind, blind guides, fools. I mean, that's kind of like name calling, but it's accurate. He, he's using metaphors of association and saying, you see, there's an appropriate time to be angry. You blind Pharisees, you hypocrites, you snakes, you brutal vipers. Wow, this is powerful. He's giving them a tongue lashing. Do you know one place in the Gospels that said Jesus gave them an angry look? My kids know what that is. Especially when we're growing up in church and I'm up in the pulpit and speaking and they're out misbehaving. I give them the angry look and they would know we're dead meat when the service is over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Anger. There's an appropriate place. The meek person knows when it is appropriate and when it is not and knows when to display the right amount, the right kind, the right way, their anger. Gentle, meek Jesus, I want to tell you, was really ticked off by the self-righteous. And it was appropriate to do so. It was appropriate to do so. Jesus was also gentle and meek when the teachers of the law came to him and the Pharisees, and they brought a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, they said, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. You know, I always ask myself when I get here, where's the guy? Hmm. Caught in the act. Where's the guy? Well, he brings just, they just bring the gal, okay? It says in the law of Moses, it commands us to stone such a woman. It does. It commands that you stone an adulterer or an adulteress. Now what do you say? They're baiting Jesus. They were using this question as a trap. In order to have a basis for accusing him one way or the other, they're, gonna, you know, they're, they're looking for, uh, uh, they're probing and trying to find something. It's a witch hunt. Isn't that what we call it? A witch hunt. Trying to find something on Jesus. And Jesus knows this. And so Jesus bends down and he starts to write in the sand or the, the dirt in the ground, I wish I knew what he was writing. I speculate. You want to join my speculation? Because it doesn't say. I think he starts writing the Ten Commandments. That's what I think. I don't know if he reshuffled the deck like we saw a couple weeks ago. He reshuffled the deck when he approached the rich young man that Wanted to know how to get eternal life. He shuffled the deck so that one was left out and that was the one that was the man's problem. I don't know what he's doing, but I think he's writing the Ten Commandments. And Jesus started to write uh, on the ground with his finger. And, and when they kept on questioning him, he's just standing there writing, uh, or, or, or he's down there just writing, and he says, and he straightens up and he said to, to them, if any of you is without sin, see, that's why I think he put the Ten Commandments down. He's laying it out. And he said, if any of you are, are without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then Jesus wrote on the ground some more. At this point, they began one by one, the older one first, until only Jesus was left. I wonder again what he's writing. See, I think the first time he's writing Ten Commandments. I just got this idea in my head, okay? It's not in the Bible. It's just my guess. He starts writing their names next to him. <laughs> Woo, that'd be a little close. <laughs> He's exposing me. <laughs> so they start taking off. Boom, one by one, man, they're leaving. 
from the oldest, he picks on the oldest because you should know better. In that way we treat, you should know better. That's what we say to our oldest kid. You should know better. And you're to be an example for the rest. He said, you should know better. He said, one by one, he started writing their names right next to it. So the only one left there standing is the woman. The woman is the only one left standing. This is where the passage becomes really powerful. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where, where are they? No one condemns you? Everyone who was angry with her because, well, in their self-righteousness, they were condemning her, they're gone. You know, the only one who was truly righteous and holy and just was standing right there with her. And this is what it says. No one, sir, uh, no one's here to condemn me. Then neither do I condemn you. You know, put, your, put yourself in the woman's shoes. Caught, how embarrassing. Isolated, taken out. You know the other party's just as guilty as you, but unjust, unfairly treated. Ever been that way? Zeroed in, pulled out, isolated, treated differently. You're accused and other people aren't and you're stuck. Uh, put yourself in her shoes. And Jesus then, he says, neither do I condemn you. How many of you know the verse John 3, 16? I bet you do. How many you know that verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The very next verse says, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. Is this beautiful? God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn you. That's why he said, neither do I condemn you. But that the world through him might be saved. God, God doesn't want to condemn you. He wants to save you. God wants to save you. Imagine how she feels at this moment. Everyone else has condemned her. But Jesus is saying, I love you enough to not condemn you. And then he makes this little statement. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. You know, this is like, believe in me and then change your life to live for me. I'll tell you, out of everybody who could have condemned her, Jesus could have condemned her. But being meek, Jesus condemns the self-righteous, but he does not condemn the repentant, humble person who stands before him like this woman. He knows when to be angry, when not to be angry. He's the perfect gentleman. You see this? You see this? You know, Paul was a, a gentle and meek person too. He was uh, meek, he says, with the meekness and gentleness of Christ. All that meekness and gentleness of Christ that you can conjure up in your mind, being the perfect gentleman, he says, I appeal to you. I, I, I'm following in Jesus' steps. And just a couple things I want you to notice. First of all, it's a bold meekness. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold went away. See, that's what they're accusing Paul of. Oh, Paul, you're bold when, we, when we're face to face, but when you're, uh, uh, you're timid when we're face to face. You're, 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 but you're bold in what you write to us. He says, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. Obviously, there were Christians who were not living like Christians. And he's saying, I'm going to have to be bold with them. Like when I have a child and it's disobedient, I have to be bold in my discipline. He said, I'm going to have to be bold. He said, I don't want to be. Like a parent doesn't want to be bold. You'd rather praise your child. He says, I expect it. Some people who think that we live by the standards of this world, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. He goes on and says, for some say, that Paul, but regarding his letters, his letters are weighty and forceful, but in, in his person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Such people should realize that what we are in our letters when we are absent, we will be in our actions when we are present. We need to be consistent. 
We need to be consistent. People should be able to say, hey, I know that person. That's, that's not like them. They're not an angry person. Oh, they only get angry over things that really matter. They should be, we should have a consistency. You see, you can be gentle and meek too, just like Jesus. God commands as a prisoner for the Lord. Then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be gentle. Be meek. Be the perfect gentleman or lady. Be that person. It's a command. It's given to all of us. Be patient, bearing one another in love. It's produced by the Spirit. God commanded it, and He's never commanded us anything that He won't assist us and help us to go overcome and do. If He commands me to be meek, then He will provide the resource to do that. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. I don't have to be an angry person. I don't have to be an angry person. I can choose to be something else. I can be the meek person. Years ago, I went to an anger specialist. I was really angry that my wife was divorcing me. I was really angry. I was ticked. Not you. <laughs> I was, though. And so I went to an anger specialist. I met with this guy a few weeks, and I finally said, man, I said, I got this. I, I, I just got this anger. I said, is there something really wrong with me? And he said to me, uh, no, what you're doing is pretty normal. He said, uh, you are reacting to a situation. And he said, you're trying to control it. I'm trying to control it. And uh, I put a bunch of verses together, and I carried them in my pocket so that I would not get out of control. All right. There's a verse in Proverbs. The fool gives full vent to his anger. The fool gives full vent. He erupts. But the wise man keeps himself under control. Isn't that a great verse? Book of James. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Oh, man. I want the righteous life. I'm not going to have that. The blessing of God, while I've got man's anger, I got to, I've got to do like Jesus. I've got to be meek. I, I cannot let the sun go down on my wrath, so I've got to deal with things that bother me today in a constructive way where I get solutions to the problems and don't blow up on people or internalize it on myself. The Holy Spirit produces that in you. When you walk in the Spirit, when you yield to the Spirit, when you give your life over to the Spirit, when you ask the Lord Jesus, what should I do? You used to wear the bracelets, what would Jesus do? You just say, Jesus, what should I do? And you respond like Jesus would have responded. He would respond in a meek way. Walk in the Spirit. And he will produce gentleness, meekness. He will generate, all right, self-control in the area of your anger. He's in that business. Let's pray. Father in heaven, perhaps there's someone here today. They've got bottled up anger or bitterness or, or Lord, they've been exploding on someone. Either way, Lord, they're handling their anger wrong. They need to reconnect with you. That's what we need. We, we want to be that gentle person who's cool, calm, and collected, and, and Lord knows how to respond to situations, know when to blow up and be angry about a problem, but in a constructive way. And take all that energy and focus it on the problem. Know when not to say anything, but they say, neither do I condemn you. We need a wisdom that comes from above. Lord, we know that we can only get that when we walk in the Spirit. So today, may we yield to your word. May we yield to the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our heart. That when something angers us, that we say, how am I going to deal with this? 
so that I don't blow up on people, I don't internalize it on myself, but I solve the problem. Lord, we know when we do, you'll bless us. You'll bless us. We'll become the peacemakers and not the war makers. Teach us to be gentle. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isn't that what we really want? We want the glory of the Lord to rise among us to rise within me, and meekness, meekness will bring glory to the Lord. Being the perfect gentleman, the perfect lady, always controlling your anger, uh, not always stuffing it, sometimes letting it out in a constructive way, always focusing on the problem and not a person. Brings glory to the Lord, let it rise. Father in heaven, may we let it rise the fruit of the Spirit within our lives, bringing glory to your great name. Dismiss us, Lord. Send us out to manifest, not a spirit of condemnation, but a spirit of acceptation, of love, of deliverance and salvation that's found in Jesus Christ. We ask that many would see it and fear and trust in the Lord. And that we would always be ready to give everyone the reason of hope that lies within us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. Uh,